how to depolarize dialogue. Hi, I'm Monika Hutnik, and I help leaders learn how to lead their international and virtual teams. Together with my team at ETA Leadership and Culture, we make the change happen by means of training, coaching, or facilitation. This podcast, A Step Ahead, has been created for all who want to grow in such an international remote environment, who want to grow as leaders, as HR, as change agents, and simply as humans. I'm inviting you here for discoveries and insights. All recording and materials are available at www.stepahead.pro. As a company, we are sometimes called in to deal with tensions in a team. Our facilitated interventions bring a good outcome, letting a team get over a point where people have stopped speaking to each other. And so far, we have always been able to bring a team to the point where they have planned some common future forward. But you can imagine that in some of these situations, the tensions are very strong. And we are always on search for better and more effective ways of working with tensions in a team. And this is how I found a course on depolarizing dialogue this last summer in Groningen in Netherlands. And I was learning how to let people start speaking to each other, even in situations where the difference of standpoints seems to be enormous. And dialogue is the first step towards working out a solution. This is what I believe. This is also what I have witnessed in many teams that we have worked with and also been a part of. So the person who was facilitating that course was Maya Nenadovich. And I am so happy that she agreed to be my guest today. Uh, Maya is sharing her perspective on how to bring people to talk to each other, also in a virtual team. So many teams and so many organizations have now gone virtual. Many managers suffer from the challenge of being in touch with their people, of keeping the relationship. And what becomes even more difficult is having a dialogue. What do we do in a situation when there is a polarized dialogue, when there is a situation which we do not agree with or that we see differently? How to run it? How to, you know, be effective in such a situation? I have invited an amazing expert who can tell us a lot about how to do dialogue and maybe even more importantly, how to depolarize dialogue in case it goes, you know, astray this way, that way. Maya Nenadovich is my guest today. Maya, I'm so glad to have you. Thank you for having me, Monica. I'm very uh, pleased to be here. Maya, you are bringing so much experience in depolarizing dialogue and in inviting people for a dialogue. And your life story here is absolutely striking. Can you tell us more about what you do and what brought you into this field? Uh, well, it's quite a long story, as you hinted at yourself, but I guess I'll just go, I'll rewind only as far into high school. Uh, in high school, I joined a debate club, and this means that for now, more than 20 years in my life, I've been both a debater, but also a debate coach and a debate trainer and a debate adjudicator. And I very much love the activity of formal academic debate because it's really one of the best tools to build critical thinking. We all know nowadays, I mean, there's a lot of lament going on that young people need critical thinking, that the current educational systems do not teach it adequately. So in that sense, I always found that debating as an academic activity is something that really takes us to the critical thinking space. However, as I was growing up, I realized that part of the problem is, in fact, debate. The part of the problem that I saw in real life, so to speak, is the fact that people end up debating each other without rules and without having an adjudicator present who is going to then in the end, you know, rule over whose arguments were more persuasive. What we call this debating is simply quarreling in many cases. In fact, yes, the quarreling, discussing, arguing, you can use many synonyms for it. I call it debate simply because I see similar elements are present. But the, you know, the main element is I want my opinion to win over yours. 
I want to be right because I think you're wrong. <laughs> and uh, it was this realization that debate outside of formal constraints of having rules and having an adjudicator, I realized that this was quite problematic. And this is how I started moving really away from debate and more towards dialogue. Now, all of this shift that was happening also came as a result of me trying to process a little bit legacy of my childhood. And here comes the tiny fact about me, which is that I was born in a country that no longer exists. Uh, Yugoslavia is a country, was a country in Europe that effectively fell apart in a series of conflicts that we, its inhabitants, uh, many of us, we didn't see it coming. So in that sense, when you combine all of these pieces together, I came to believe and I came to work in a field that believes that communication is essential for resolving conflicts, just as conflicts are inevitable. That's a striking beginning of a life <laughs> dedicated to helping people communicate, in fact. And, you know, when I was listening to you and this debating, trying to convince the other person, I thought about those competences of managers. We focus a lot on, you know, managers being like outgoing, present, a strong personality. I think in the Central Eastern Europe, we are more into this kind of a model of what we imagine a manager would be like. Some of my coaching clients, even when they do not identify with this kind of a personality, they even struggle to imagine themselves in, in a role of a manager. You know, a lot of push competences. Yes, a lot of competences to push, to insert pressure, yes, to convince and again to push. And what I'm hearing from you is that actually this might bring a counter effect of escalating a conflict and not really depolarizing the dialogue. What we need probably as managers is many more pool competences, which includes listening to the other party. So let's start from the beginning. Why would we like to have a dialogue in a workplace? Why to enter a dialogue, especially that that we might imagine or we might even know that the other person might have a differing view? But that's a very big question. But I think that it really is superseded by, for me, this realization that we spend a lot of time at our work. So if we just assume that we have, well, it's not an assumption, it's a fact, we have 24 hours in a day. Let's assume we sleep eight hours, that leaves 16. Out of those 16, out of those 16 waking hours that you have, eight of them, again, I'm being very traditional here in my assumptions, but eight of them are spent at work. So that means that 50% of your waking hours are spent in a working professional environment. I find that a lot of times some companies, some professional environments, if they avoid dialogue, if they avoid uh, confronting difficult topics, if they avoid resolving conflict or trying to mediate it, what they're in fact doing is they're promoting fragmentation. And what do I mean by fragmentation? You, Monica, are the same person at home as you are in your workplace, except that depending on your workplace, not all of your qualities will be rewarded or perceived as such. Who you are at home in your private sphere, I believe, should be used in as much as a valuable contribution as who you are in your professional sphere. I'm certain, I'm simply certain that you use some professional tricks and tools and tips in your home environment. And the only thing I'm saying here is that we should try and find a way not to promote fragmentation of who we are. And let me just give you an example. I've noticed that often there is a rise in conflicts and there's a rise in polarization or in just simply uncomfortable situations in the workplace when there is a lead up to elections. And this is a very interesting example because right in your professional sphere, you have a professional role. You're doing a job, you're doing a series of tasks and these tasks are evaluated by your manager and then you get a plus or a minus or whatever. However, your ideology in terms of which candidate you support, which political party you believe in, it might end up surfacing during a coffee break or during, you know, witnessing a colleague say something that actually indicates that they support a very different opinion than yours, a very different set of values, a very different candidate. And then what happens? What happens is a sense of conflict or a sense of people not having same views on something. 
And then these two individuals either might get into conflict or they just might simply even experience a chilling of relations, meaning you might not even want to necessarily deal with that colleague that much. You might end up avoiding them. But I believe that all of our interactions would be healthier if we could simply be who we are everywhere. And by that, I'm saying not necessarily hide our opinions, but at the same time, to be able to agree to disagree in a civilized manner. Agree to disagree in a civilized manner. I think you're hitting the nail here. We don't need to be the same, like clones, which which we are not. We can agree that the other person has different opinions, points of view, maybe even values to some extent. But let's agree to disagree and let's continue collaborating on the other fields. I think this mechanism which you mentioned, the, the avoiding, avoiding the other person, avoiding the confrontation, avoiding contact is so strong. I would even say, from my observations, the larger the organization, the, the, the bigger, the stronger the tendency to avoid, to avoid conflict and, and so avoid dialogue, but but it might be just the wrong way to go. Well, in my experience, again, when you avoid something, when you shove it under the carpet, so to speak, it doesn't go away. The only thing that it happens is that it accumulates, it accumulates, it grows until a point where, and there's another expression, the last drop spills over the cup. <laughs> you know, and then the whole idea with managing conflict and with managing disagreement you're managing it. And there comes that word again, manager, right? <laughs> Managers are supposed to also manage conflict and disagreements. Why? Because you don't want to get to a point that somebody explodes it, <laughs> you know, because they feel that they've been quiet, quiet, quiet for so long. And then they reach a point where they can't take it anymore. I think it's very important that we are able to discuss real life matters, even inside a professional setting, because again, companies don't exist in vacuum. Companies exist in a country, in a city, within a political sphere, within a set of cultural, sociocultural events. And in that sense, we can't treat companies as though they are somehow on some sort of alien planet and it doesn't concern them what happens in the country in which they operate or in the world in which they exist. The example of political views expressed or hidden at work, I think it's so striking, especially <laughs> as you know, I'm based in Poland and what I have been seeing in our surrounding reality is increasing polarization. It's, it has come to, a, to an extent where I personally find that the degree of polarization scary. And I think the polarization or, or the conflict of opinions might be about so many different things. One of the areas I work in is the diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. And the opinions that people have here might be so different and so differing. What if we all just shut up? <laughs> the company stops operating at all. That's that's what I'm thinking. Or there is so much tension, this invisible but very feelable tension in the team, in the company, that people simply personally explode because of the level of this stress, where, which which they maybe don't even know where it comes from. But it requires courage to get into the dialogue. It requires courage to open this Pandora's box, we might imagine. So let's talk about about the possible outcome. So what might happen if we enter a dialogue? If we start talking to somebody, what is this dialogue actually? Dialogue in its simplest terms is a joint effort at deepening our collective understanding of something. So in that sense, for me, when a conflict appears of any kind, a conflict is not something that I think we should be afraid of, because again, I think it's inevitable. You stated that it requires courage to enter into dialogue. Well, I actually don't think it does. I think it almost requires more courage to shy away from conflict and then wait for it to explode into your face. <laughs> and I know it's maybe a strange way of looking at it, but entering into dialogue means that you acknowledge the other person's humanity and you acknowledge their own autonomy and their own entitlement to their own opinions and beliefs. And then you enter into a communication journey together, whereby you hope you're going to reveal what is it that elevates the emotion so much surrounding a particular topic. So in that sense, for me, conflict is an opportunity. 
It's an opportunity to resolve potential misunderstandings, but more so than anything, it is an opportunity for you and me as two individuals who are likely going to be working together for next X amount of years to have a better working relationship because you are not going to change in terms of your opinions. I am not going to change you. You're most likely not going to change me, but I can approach you as a fellow human being. I would like to get to know you, where you're coming from, your opinions. And then maybe if you also listen to me and to me telling you a story of how I came to to believe certain things, maybe we can walk away from this interaction with the sense of a greater understanding that the people who believe in something that opposes our views are not monsters. They're simply people. As managers, we frequently look for the ways to convince, to make the other person do something or to make the other person think something. Uh, let's, let's reverse this question. Would we be interested in somebody influencing the way we think, somebody changing, modifying, or I would even provocatively say correcting the way we think because, because they imagine that we think in a wrong way. That immediately increases or arises the feelings of disagreement. Yes, I don't want to be, you know, corrected by somebody else. My thinking is my thinking. So uh, what you're saying is very much resonating with me. And uh, I'm still having in memory one of the phrases that you said, one of the examples that you gave us in, in the training, which I attended in Groningen in the Netherlands. It was just so quiet. Before the war in Yugoslavia, everything just got so quiet. People stopped talking. And I can't stop thinking about this example that you gave us. I think the the silence is a dead end street. And sometimes we, sh- we even saw in history, the dead end street is literal. Yes, which is very cruel. So let's start. <laughs> let's start the dialogue. And you said it doesn't require courage. But what if somebody imagines it does? Where to take courage? How to find this courage to st- start a dialogue? Well, you can look at it from the perspective of control, right? Because I think a lot of times we we individuals, we would like to think we have control over our own lives, right? And we don't like this idea that somebody might be impacting this sense of our own control. Well, if I initiate a dialogue, who is in control? I am. If I'm avoiding a dialogue, if I'm avoiding to communicate with you about something that bothers me, if I'm hoping that the situation will go away on its own, who is in control? Not me. (laughs) Uh, I'm definitely not. I'm basically a victim of circumstances or a victim of the situation at hand. So in that sense, I think that one thing that might encourage somebody to engage in dialogue is this element of You are the one taking initiative. You are the one in control of trying to resolve the situation at hand. But to step back a little bit to the point you talked about managers who don't like necessarily sometimes, I mean, this is an abstract category, but some managers, you said, don't like having their opinion challenged. Well, I think that this is something that we need to also ask ourselves in terms of individual characteristics that we would like to nurture, reward and promote in a professional environment. And which ones not? I personally believe that growth, self-growth, self-evolution, personal development and professional development are the kind of characteristics that indicate somebody who is willing to evolve, who is willing to learn. If somebody believes that it's my way or the highway and I know best, this type of an attitude does not necessarily indicate the mindset that is oriented towards growth and towards evolution. And I believe that this is something that we can also look at in terms of why would it be useful for us to try to step outside of, you know, the way we've always done things and to try to do things a little bit differently is because we might in the end end up growing, evolving, changing ourselves. Change is inevitable. Just as, like I said earlier, conflict is. I just think that sometimes we are spending enormous amounts of energy trying to avoid something that is inevitable. I think sometimes if we are embracing that which is inevitable, we might actually end up enjoying the journey. And it might be a little bit about the labels that we give to specific situations. We've just talked about conflict. When I hear a word conflict, I immediately get tense. I do not even need to make myself ready 
but my body has just gotten itself ready, no matter what I do or no matter what I think. Just when I hear a word conflict, I immediately get ready. So I get in this alarm state and actually resembles something that I frequently do with my groups. I also train managers and one of the topics that they like to practice with me is uh, having difficult conversations. And this is usually a query comes from a client on difficult conversations. And when we start developing the content, when we start preparing the program for the client, one of the first things that we do is change the label. So instead of difficult conversations, we, we change it, for example, to conversations that matter or important conversations. And we have uh, many experiences uh, with our groups that show that when managers imagine this is going to be a difficult conversation, they get into this fight or flight mode, which leaves very little flexibility. And they immediately get into this mode, or am I right or wrong? Who is the one to be right in this conversation? Which simply (laughs) doesn't lead to solutions. (laughs) But when we change the label to important conversations, to meaningful conversations, the outcomes are so much better and the managers are now so much flexible. Maybe we can change the name of a conflict into a, what would it be? A situation that requires a dialogue, something like this. What do you think? What do you do, Maya? I think the idea of changing the wording is quite important because I think it encapsulates the fact that we all have an emotional or neurological response to certain words. And I think that that's very important to recognize. But at the same time, I'm quite careful about changing the language to the point where it stops having meaning. Uh, I do have to be a little bit kind of strict on that one. I do believe that difficult conversations is a good example. I wouldn't call them difficult. For me, they're necessary conversations. I think you're reframing them as meaningful, as, you know, valuable, relevant. I think that's very good because the moment you put difficult in, obviously, then you raise people's alarms and you get people more stressed and or anxious that they might not be prior to such a conversation. When it comes to conflict, I think that I would be okay with demoting it to disagreement if that makes anybody happier (laughs) or if that makes anybody less anxious. But at the same time, for me, conflict is basically just this kind of a blank word that encapsulates any kind of absence of harmony. (laughs) You know, and I think that if we look at goals or utopian states of harmony and balance, I think that then when you look at what's opposite of it, there is a lot of things that are opposite. When it comes to language, I think that it's most important that the group that you're working with, that you together choose your own words, because then you're going to see so that you're clear what it means and so that you choose the language that is the most optimal for having clarity and for not evoking too much anxiety, but at the same time that is not too diplomatic or too vague so that it crosses the threshold of actually not being useful. I fully agree with you. I'm also having a reflection about approach to conflict as such. And I shared some of my thoughts with you previously when I was participating in your session. In some cultures, conflict is perceived as as such, is perceived in a more positive way and in some others in a more frightening way. And we might perhaps draw a line along the individualistic and collectivistic, yes? Between the individualistic and collectivistic cultures, the more collectivistic your culture, your group culture is the less likely conflict is going to be perceived in a positive way, the more avoidance, yes, because the group conflict is a very high risk. But if we change the wording a little bit, so conflict is scary in this case, yes, this means that I either belong to this group or to that group, no longer perceived as as an individual, and I don't want to belong to an out group to be kicked out, you know, emotionally of my team, so I better keep my mouth shut. But if we just think of it as a, disagreement or a way of also getting to know each other in a way, I think I think it opens up a little bit. It's just a spontaneous thought on how to find a courage to start a dialogue. Basically, the answer would be to think about my area of influence, which you mentioned in the beginning, and then also to think about how do I perceive, how do I define the situation in itself. 
Yes, and another thing that also obviously always plays a role, and I'm just being mindful of the context that you suggested, meaning working with different managers, is uh, the question of power Mm -hmm. and positionality. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because here also I think language comes to play a role because we can avoid the word conflict. We can simply use a much more neutral word that, in fact, might have the exact same results. And that word is competition. I'm having my ideas compete with yours. I want to win. I want my ideas to win over yours. And I think that here with managers, I think that one of the things that I think makes it more complex complex or complicated for them is the fact that they need to be very, very mindful of their own positionality and power when it comes to some of these discussions or some of these conversations, because power and positionality, they play a role within a professional setting. So in that sense, if you and I are equals, we might be more relaxed in expressing our opinions than we would be if one of us was each other's boss, for example, or a supervisor. So in that sense, I think this is something that plays a role and we should just simply be mindful of it. So this is uh, why it particularly makes sense when we start having a dialogue, when we meet for a dialogue, it particularly makes sense to let the other person speak first so that we as managers do not impose our point of view, opinion, direction onto the other person. Is this what I'm hearing from you? Uh, Not necessarily, because if you as a manager invite somebody else to speak first, you're inviting them onto thin ice because they're not sure what they're supposed to say, etc. I think that might be sometimes in some situations might be preferable for the manager, for the person initiating the conversation to actually frame it. And to say why we're here, why we're talking, what we're talking about, etc. And then to just simply keep it very open and just try to see how the other person sees the situation that you just illustrated ahead of them. So in that sense, yeah, the only thing I was saying when I talked about the power is just so that the managers should be mindful of it. I think sometimes they're not. And I think this is a problem. We might not realize how much influence we have on others. I've been running my business for 15 years now, and I've been discovering every time anew. That's something which might be simply a blind spot. So having a conscious reflection on it uh, would, would actually make a lot of sense. So Maya, we are already talking about, okay, how to do it, how to have a meeting on dialogue, how to depolarize <laughs> some of the polarized opinions or behaviors at work. What would be some hints and tips from you on how to do it? I will summarize. We said framing. We said listen a lot. We said be mindful of your own influence. What would be important to look at in this process? Well, I think it's another thing that would be quite important is the element of freedom. And by freedom, I mean people's autonomy and willingness to participate. I think sometimes there is a pushback and there is disagreement and there is resistance when you call meetings where it's compulsory to participate, right? Then you really kind of drag people out of their comfort zone and you put them into a setting where they might even resent you for the fact that you did that, right? So I think that with these kind of situations, if you are acknowledging, noticing, registering elements of polarization in your company surrounding a particular topic, I would definitely advise that as you call a dialogue or a meeting on it, that you make it optional. Meaning only those people who wish to attend are welcome, invited to attend. I believe this in the first step, simply because sometimes we think that if we just get everybody into a room and we tell them how they're supposed to behave, (laughs) and from now on, you're not supposed to do X, Y, Z, and now problem solved, right? We can continue living our lives, but it doesn't work that way. So this is why I would definitely always advocate for the slower approach. Now, obviously, it might happen that nobody shows up in your well-intentioned optional session on a topic that you called together, uh, then I would suggest creating some sort of anonymous system for people airing their grievances, for people to give you their opinions without attaching their name to it. And then if you create this type of anonymous system, then it's okay to invite people for a joint meeting that that is mandatory for everybody. Why? Because you have given them the chance to voice their opinions prior whilst announcing them that we want to hear you because we want to have a meeting about this because we think this is important. I just think that process is incredibly important. Dialogue is a process in and of itself. So I think the process and how you set up setting the context, the, the space 
for such a dialogue is as important as the dialogue process itself. I am fully aligned with you. I'm also thinking about some of the projects that we do as a consulting company. Sometimes we are called in to support leadership teams. And we don't talk about conflicts in those situations, but usually projects are initiated either by HR or by a leader of the leadership team. And they talk to us about some tensions, about some inefficiencies, more like this kind of a language. And when we realize that there is so much tension in the team, what we do is we meet each of the member of this team individually for a little conversation. Like, so how do you see this particular situation? What works? What doesn't work? What do you see as a possible solution? What's really troubling for you? You know, this kind of questions that we ask in individual conversations, depending on the situation, obviously. And then we invite everybody and we kind of present these answers in a way which doesn't show who was speaking, just kind of a summary yes, of what we heard, the most important points. Uh, with no indication on individuals, which gives a lot of safety, but also it finally lets the team get it from under the table and, uh, you know, have facts that they can relate to. So it seems that what we've been doing so far is also in line with with what you're saying. But what about one-on-one conversations? What hints would you have there? But effectively, my approach is quite simple. I would always advocate that you as an individual who is consciously entering a conversation with somebody who might not share your views on something, that you pause and that you remind yourself that whatever is being stated in that conversation that you should not take personally, because the person is just expressing their views. They're not expressing their views as a way of aggravating or annoying you personally. Uh, The second step I believe you should do is you should listen and you should listen while suspending judgment. You should listen by asking clarifying questions when you're not sure that you understood something that was being said. As you're listening throughout, you should try as much as you can to find empathy and understanding for where the person is coming from. Now, when I say empathy, I don't mean you're supposed to legitimize or agree with the person. The only thing I'm asking you is to acknowledge that the person you're speaking to did not have your parents, did not grow up in the town that you grew up in, and that does not have your life experiences. So obviously they have a different life path that led them to view things differently than you do. Throughout this whole process of conversation, I would want you to try to understand the assumptions on which their opinions are based so that by the time you speak, and ideally you should only speak after you're invited to speak and share your opinion, that you speak in such a way that you try to refer to their examples, to their words, to the experiences that they shared with you whilst you were listening to them in the previous period. And throughout this moment, throughout this conversation, I would want you to manage your own expectations and to remind yourself that you're not trying here to change somebody's mind. You're here in order to try to understand them. You're here in order to try to understand where they're coming from. But you're also engaged in this conversation primarily because you're trying to evolve yourself and your own resistance to whatever set of ideas this other person is expressing. And now don't get me wrong. I mean, you might end up talking to people who have uh, ideas that scare you. You might end up talking to people who have ideas that are very, very much objectionable and something that attacks the core of your being. But even in those situations, I would still hope that throughout the conversation, you could find it in yourself that you walk away from that dialogue, having perceived that individual again as a human being and not as some sort of subhuman entity that is worthy of being somehow expelled or dealt with. Because this is the kind of opinions that we've had in our past in Europe. And these are the kind of opinions that we continue to have when it comes to individuals and groups whose opinions we don't like. We have a tendency as a society to try to get rid of them. And I think that this is the kind of tendency that we need to acknowledge in ourselves and then try to find a way to have a different approach 
because getting rid of anybody is not a recipe for a happy society. Uh, after you get rid of somebody, I'm thinking, for example, dismissing somebody from a team, you just find another one that later on you focus on and want to dismiss again. <laughs> That's a good example, because sometimes, I mean, I've seen this in several companies that I've worked with, which is that they think that the problem is somebody's personality. They think that somebody is not a good fit for our organizational culture, right? But I think that the problem with this kind of opinion is that if you look at the history of your decisions, dismissals, etc., you sometimes realize that some problems, some conflicts happen over and over again. And then it simply can't be that it was somebody's individual personality that was the wrong fit. The problem is bigger. What if we have this conversation with, with the other person? What might be some of the useful questions that we might use to deepen our understanding? Would you share a few examples? I would always start with what you also yourself suggested earlier, which is to get you to get the other person to tell you how they see the situation. Because sometimes the things that we ourselves find problematic, other people might not, you know. So I think we need to be also open to the idea that if we might perceive something as a problem, other people might not perceive it as a problem at all. So then even having a conversation about it means that we're starting off from very different starting points. So I'm thinking of some questions immediately. So how do you see this? How does it look like from your perspective? And why is it so? So how do these two facts combine from your perspective? Yes, and... Absolutely. And also to try to use questions that are kind of, I call it, they force people to have empathy. So for example, that you ask somebody, why do you think that this is causing a situation? for me or for somebody else, you know, can you imagine, can we hypothesize together why you think that this might be, you know, showing up in the workplace as a potential problem, you know, because then you're asking people to also a little bit step outside of themselves. So I don't want you to just map out their position. I want you to try to invite them to step into somebody else's shoes. To broaden perspectives on both sides. Absolutely. In fact, maybe it's a strange question to ask, but as a manager, how can we live with a difference, with such a difference in a team? How can we live with that? <laughs> well, you're, you're saying you know, your question implies that it's difficult, but we both know that research shows that diversity, in fact, enriches companies right? Both in terms of results, both in terms of ideas, both in terms of creativity. So in that sense, diversity is something that is cherished in companies. And we want, and we want companies to reflect the diverse societies we have. We don't want to have companies, you know, run by men 50 plus and only having 50 plus, you know, men working for them or whatever. We need to have diversity in order to make sure that we don't have blind spots. Uh, but the problem with diversity, equity and inclusion as a system currently on the rise is that I think that it's being implemented in such a way that it's being treated a little bit more as window dressing rather as genuine change. Meaning, you know, if I have a diversity, equity, inclusion words written in my hiring policy, check, I've done that. If I hire three minority people, then great, I've done that. But this is not what DEI is. So in that sense, I think that for managers, how to deal with it, I think that the first and foremost, what we need to acknowledge, which is something that is not talked about, I think, quite often or even at all, is the fact that we're expecting people to take on board and to deal with DEI issues without ever having given anybody training on how to do it. So in that sense, you might have done, you know, an MBA, you might have some experience with managing people. But then you're put in a position where you're supposed to also add DEI elements to your work. And let's face it, you're not necessarily trained in how to do this. So I really believe that some basic courses, some conflict resolution training, some mediation, some dialogue trainings, uh, I think all of that would be useful for people who need to do DEI work or DEI elements in their work, but who don't know how or where to start. I think we need to acknowledge the idea that sometimes DEI is done badly, not because people have bad intentions or because people doing it are bad. 
it ends up being done badly because people are not trained in how to approach it properly. And because very often companies don't give sufficient support for genuine DEI work that is meant to result in happy diverse stuff and and having the courage to also be different from each other including different Absolutely. positions i agree with you fully from what i'm observing and also from what clients ask us to do is a lot of about diversity awareness so let's see that there are many groups of people types of people uh, needs in people and so on so there's a lot of like information pushed onto the population in, in a company, but there is not enough. I wouldn't say there isn't any, but there is not enough focus on skills. Okay, so now I know that, so what shall I do about that? Let's practice. Let's not only listen to, about to that, but also let's practice having this dialogue session like we do in those uh, conversations, which I initially told you about the difficult so-called conversations, which we now call the conversations that matter. We talked a lot about the perspective of men and thank you very much for bringing this focus. Maybe the final question, which, which I still would like to ask is, what about HR? HR has this supporting function, enabling function, sometimes the activating function. How can this role help managers in a company or people in the company in general to have uh, more open dialogues? Well, again, it's quite a difficult question because, as you know, in my experience, HR and people are in culture. Departments, they differ from company to company, right? Uh, they differ from company to company in terms of how much power they have, in terms of how well integrated they are within a company, or the experience that I've had, the extent to which they're isolated from the rest of the company, which is even really funny. Sometimes they're just asked to hire people with this set of, you know, skills and qualifications and then whatever. And I think that with HR, I think that they should find themselves more integrated within different departments. And I think that they should find ways to organize check-ins. Because I think the HR team is really there best suited to check in with people at different levels occasionally in order to preempt and detect stress, anxiety, competition, conflict, whatever word you want to use, even before it maybe sometimes comes to a manager's attention. And I think that HR, if they were to assume this listening mode in a much more intentional way, could be a much more valuable piece of a company puzzle than they are at the moment. So the key word which I'm getting from you is listening. We've just spent the podcast episode talking about how can we, in fact, take the courage to listen what other people might want to say and how can we incorporate more listening into our daily life at work maybe also outside work i would fully support that also from the perspective of hr as a supporting function actually i was reading recently an hbr harvard business review article on what skills are the most appreciated in the c level and the listening was on top. So I would treat it as a closing message for our conversation. And I would still open the floor for you. What's the closing message that you would like to give? Well, I'm very happy that you are kind of focusing on listening for our closing part of this podcast and this very enjoyable conversation. Because again, let's go back to the beginning. As a debater, I was taught that listening is paramount because you have to listen to your opponent in order to be able to really attack their arguments. And this is something that I need to really advocate here and uh, point out because that is a form of active listening. Active listening is I'm listening to you, but I'm already preparing what I'm going to tell to you after you finish talking. However, the kind of listening that I would advocate is deep listening. And this is a deep listening form whereby I'm listening to you whilst fully trying to control any impulse I have to formulate already my response to you. I'm listening just in order to understand who you are and where you're coming from. And this kind of deep listening is the kind of listening that involves asking clarifying questions, asking follow-up questions, uh, because if we can just pause, if we can just control our own desire to immediately insert our own perspective and our own opinion, we might end up getting to know somebody much better than we otherwise would have. And I think that this is always a gamble worth taking. Thank you so much, Maya. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you a lot, Monica. It was my pleasure to be a guest. 
and uh, I look forward to further following your work. Would debate be a way to bring people together? It might seem that the format of debating gives both sides an opportunity to present their arguments. So, among others, we did experience uh, debating sessions in Maya's course, and I couldn't be more surprised of the outcome. Just guess. At the end of the debate, we were all much more into our own arguments and even more polarized than in the beginning. Moreover, we started seeing people from the other groups as wrong. On the contrary, we believed the more strongly that we were right. It was a shocking experience that let me understand and feel that trying to convince someone is a dead end street. What brought good energy and what brought outcomes was listening and asking more questions. It's so important and even more important in the virtual setting. So three major conclusions that I'm taking from this episode are, first of all, people with opposing views are not monsters. They are people just like anyone and you can learn about them. Secondly, starting a dialogue means that you are in control. I love this part. Thirdly, there is a striking difference between listening with the purpose to counterattack and deep listening, where you try to deeply understand the other person as a human being. Find all the notes to this podcast episode at www.astepahead.pro slash 011, just like the number of this episode. If you like to get informed about the new content, the new conversations which I'm running, please do join the newsletter. You can see the, the link at the top of the portal site, a stepahead.pro. Please just leave your email address not to miss out on any new conversation that I'm able to make. And if you are a LinkedIn user, you might also find me at a step ahead by Monika Hutnik and just be able to see some of the background pictures, uh, some of the conversations which I'm about to make. Let's do it. Other interesting resources that are already available in the Step Ahead portal is, first of all, the psychological safety. I think it's so important to be able to ask questions, to be able to doubt, and also to be able to express critique in a safe way. So this particular episode focuses on psychological safety in a virtual team, and it gives you four steps to mastery, and it's a step ahead 003, so slash 003. Three, this is what you need to put into the browser. A another episode about the little ways to express your affirmation, your confirmation that you are listening to the other person, that you are also open to listen to the other person, is about micro affirmations. What are micro affirmations and why you want to have them in your team? The episode number four, so a step ahead dot pro slash zero zero four. And finally, a great conversation with Kinga Yashkoviak from the Hewlett Packard Enterprise, the human centered leadership, the cure for times of change. It's really like a building block for all these episodes here where we really focus on dealing with people. You know, after all, leadership is just a series of conversations. And this is what we need to be able to, to do as leaders. Who of your colleagues and friends would enjoy listening to this episode? Please do share with her or with him. It's really important to me to reach more people with the great interviews and ideas that they bring. So can you do it now? Thank you so much. And take care. Goodbye. Goodbye.